as the Gambia is not an exception to natural disasters and hydromet. ECOWAS officials came together to discuss with the country's vice president, Dr. Isa Toure, to find ways to improve hydromet and disaster issues in the West African subregion. The Commissioner of Social Affairs and Gender at the ECOWAS Commission, Siga Fatima Jain, described the meeting as important, nothing that it will help the member states to work together to reduce disaster-related issues. Commissioner Jang said it is a privilege for the Gambia as a country to be part of the meeting. I think the vice president and the minister are very encouraged because this is something that is really needed in Gambia and that they are happy that we are actually having the meeting in Gambia. It's a privilege for Gambia to have this meeting and it's a need that they also have. But also Gambia is going to be showcased as a country where we can use the inf technical information that we are discussing to improve uh, the disaster risk and to also include improve the hydromet um, issues, make sure that we tackle them before they get big by doing predictions in terms of knowing the, when the rain is coming, how much will come so that the farmers will be prepared knowing which areas will be flooding so people can avoid them. So these are the things that we will be discussing at the technical level. Siga Fatima Jain added that it is important to work on risk reduction to make sure that they are able to dig floods, fires and other natural disasters in countries before they strike. Commissioner of Agriculture and Environment at the ECOWAS Commission said, the meeting is important and strategic as it will help strengthen the capacity of hydromet and disaster in ECOWAS countries. Because it's very important uh, this, for this service to have the capacity to collect data, to analyze the data, and uh, to prepare the, the good recommendation uh, for high markers to decide and uh, to assure the protection, the efficiency, the efficiency for all population in uh, our country. Many West African countries do not yet have enough hydrological capacity to collect, process and disseminate climate information and early warning to vulnerable communities. As a result, the proceedings of the ECOWAS Hydromet and Disaster Risk Reduction Platform, which was established in 2018, is an ECOWAS mission with contributions from the government of Cote d'Ivoire, World Bank and European Union, among others, to address the issues of hydromet and natural disasters in African countries. Reporting for iAfrica News, I am DCC. Kidnappings in Nigeria have become a huge problem that the government is yet to fully tackle. The problem is especially prevalent in the north of the country, and bandits not only target individuals, they've been increasingly attacking schools and abducting many students. But a local artificial intelligence firm in the city of Ibadan in Oyo State, southwest Nigeria, believes it has a solution to Nigeria's kidnappings problem. Robotics and Artificial Intelligence Nigeria, or RIN for short, is a pioneer Nigerian indigenous robotics firm. And its founder, Olushola Yola, says he's created a specialized drone tracker that could track and locate kidnappers and bandits. Today, the military or the, the police are using drones to just check if they can see footpaths and then follow the footpaths. How about when those footpaths lead into a cave? How about when those footpaths lead into a canopy of in, 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 in a forest? How do you track the rest of the movement from there? We have a different solution, a different approach. We're not using cameras. You can use cameras just to map your environment, but we're not using cameras to track bandits. 
we are using a different kind of sensor, and it's the carbon sensor, carbon emission sensor. You can't escape it. Bandits often use remote forests as their hideouts and launching grounds to stage attacks. Ayola says with his carbon emission detection tracker mounted on a drone, kidnappers and bandits have no chance of escape due to the carbon dioxide they emit. If you have 100 kidnapped students in your lookout, in your cave, they're going to all breathe out carbon dioxide. When you have um, all of them there, you need to feed them, you need to cook for them. You need to transport them from one location to another, so bikes and all of those, petrol and all of that, generating sets and so on. So there's no hiding, really, if we are tracking your carbon emissions. You can't hide from it. And in a forested area, there's a threshold for what carbon emission should be if there are no human activities there. So any spike that is noticed higher than the expected in a forested area signifies location of human beings there. The Nigerian government has not yet assessed Ayola's innovation, but security experts say it's a welcome development and should be given a try. We are faced with a situation where we are dealing with targets that are difficult to penetrate, such as the ungoverned spaces of the forest. So technology will be not only a force multiplier, but it would definitely help in um, clarifying some of the challenges that the Nigerian security um, architecture is currently encountered with. If, for instance, the technology is adaptable and you can create convergence between what the technology is creating and the existing platform that the Nigerian security uh, are using, then yes, it can be a win-win for everyone. The tracker is ready. The only problem is that we can't deploy it privately. You cannot deploy a drone unless you are working for a security agency. So let's say the military came to us and said, deploy this to, uh, let's, let's, use, let's, give, let's give it a test. Then they would have the license to fly a drone across states, across areas like that. So it's something that can only come to life when those whose responsibility it is request to deploy them. For now, Ayola and his team are waiting for the government to put their innovation to test. It just might be the game changer in Nigeria's fight against kidnappings and banditry. The recent increment of basic commodities has raised a great concern for Gambians, especially ordinary citizens. Consumers, traders and vendors have blamed one another for the sudden hike in prices of the commodities. According to the Minister of Trade, Industry, Regional Integration and Employment, CDK M. Keta, the pandemic has killed out the global production level and the international commodity prices have been surging from April 2020. Mr. Keta said the external factors are responsible for the rise in prices of essential commodities, adding that it is beyond their control. As can be observed from above, these external factors account for more than 80% of the increase in the domestic prices. These external factors are the principal cause of the increase and are beyond our control and can only be ameliorated when the global production and associated shock to the supply chain recovers. According to the World Food Program, as of April 16, 2021, food prices in West Africa have jumped by more than 30% since last year to their highest level in nearly a decade due to coronavirus lockdowns and a decline in production. The Economist Global Commodity Index food for food has increased by 39% in the year to April 13, 2020. This was sourced from the Economist magazine as of 17th of April on Saturday. According to Yenko Badabo, the Commissioner General of the Gambia Revenue Authority, they have created a direct delivery fee for all business individuals. We also have given them uh, the opportunity for what we call a direct delivery facility, DD. It means that uh, for those who are not very much involved in the international trade, if you have a goods at the port, you clear, you take care of the expenses of the ports and other stakeholders, your goods are there, and at the time we know life is difficult, you don't have the money to pay, you will apply and then the 
GRE will give you what we call the facility, direct delivery facility. You will have these goods taken out of the port to your premises or to your shop, and you can make sales after 30 days, then you can come back and pay. And I think this is a big burden, you know, that was lifted from the heads of the business community um, in the sense that instead of you pay upfront, we are now allowing you to take the goods uh, with you and then after one month or 45 days, you come back and settle it. So the Director General for Gambia Competition, Consumer Protection Commission, Ahmad Sisi, revealed that they have engaged suppliers to rest on the treasure on what a wholesale should be. The ministry promised to work with the government to do everything possible to ensure that the essential commodities are available, accessible and affordable. Reporting for iAfrica News, I am Amidao. The UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, said families separated as they flee violence in northern Mozambique are supporting each other, but urgent help is needed as the number grows. Palma had always been a sleepy fishing town until last year when it was transformed into a driving hub for Mozambique gas industry. The resurgent entered on the 24th of March and attacked a rapidly growing town with significant foreign investment and more than 1,000 foreign workers. Abdullah Musa, a protection officer at the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, warned that this number could cross the million mark by June this year if the ongoing violence does not stop. He said the UNHCR was putting in place measures to receive more arrivals in the coming days and staffs are reaching areas outside Pemba to assist newly displaced people. We have seen several families arriving in Pemba, very traumatized and in difficult situations. These people somehow get separated from their relatives, including children separated from their parents. We are addressing this together with other humanitarian organizations and the government to find solutions for them. Maria, an internally displaced person, said she was forced to flee two times due to the attacks. She first flee to the coastal town of Palma in March after non-state armed groups attacked her village in northern Mozambique. A year later, she had to flee again, leaving everything behind after Palma was attacked. The 31-year-old mother of three got separated from her husband as they flew. <laughs> My heart tells me not to go anywhere and wait for my husband. When my husband gets here, we will know where to go. Maria volunteered with UNHCR to organize discussion with new arrivals shared information on the importance of COVID-19 and cholera prevention measures to other women. She also helped to identify gender-based violence survivors and refer them to the UNHCR for assistance. Daí ficamos aqui com muitas pessoas e arranjamos um grupo. We are staying at the center with many people, and we are working in different groups in the areas of hygiene, communication, and health. Water is also being provided for hand washing to prevent children getting sick. The UNHCR said the number of people displaced by the recent attacks in northern Mozambique continues to rise as people still seek safety. Since March 24, more than 19,000 people have fled Palma to the towns of Nagade, Miuda, Motempes, and Pemba. Thousands more are thought to be displayed inside Palma district. Nearly 700,000 people, mainly women, children and the elderly, are internally displayed in northern Mozambique as a result of recording attacks and violence by non-state armed groups since October 2017. For our African News, I am Fatou Kasim. Tayumako, 
dafa ne ci ma ciono di dem dekk ba dekka rawatina ba fofu ci senegal jëndi dal jeexna fi ci bi rew ak stroll company se jaxle jeexna waaw di len defar bepp xeti dal te itam di nay dege rafet ci ay ñek yu yomb company bi le di stroll di len la defaral dal aso bi fekke na da nga nek ci political party bu ga nga nuro leg say way ngay dem fofu ci stroll company yi dal di la defaral dal bu deugeur baax te rafet mo xam itam da nga am xew bu ga seyere nuro ak sa dal demal seti ni di stroll company te emun ci lolu di len la defaral sa dal ci saasi bo deme ñi nata la nga tok wax len li nga bëgg ñi defaral lako te itam di len defat dal ci wholesale wala retail seti len fofu ci suñu aladi te nak lu ci gëna neex moy doomi gambi ya moko mom tek ci di dimbalé ay ndaw bu ñi am fuñu xeyé seti len fofu ci suñu aladi ca kumku jang johnson bo deme rek di nga gis sen tablet nga dal di len dem seti sa xol ne nga am sa dal bo yag mi bit mu nga neme ku sen website bi ci www.strollshops.com wala nga on ñu 74736 692 wala 715019 extra company sa jaxle jeexna ci dam deg dekk bi ci dalal kessé Welcome back. This is Africa TV and once again thanks for joining us. Now to matters of detail I see where former Attorney General and Minister of Justice during the AFP-RC regime, Fafa Idris Mbai, said he was charged with a staggering sum of $1.5 million for tax evasion at the Al-Khali um, Commission. The veteran lawyer who appeared before the commission to testify on his dismissal from the government of AFPRC said one officer, Ibrahim Abba, called him to report him to Banjul police station where he was put under arrest and later made to appear before the Algali commission. Umar Ahmad Toure has more of that in this report. Fafambai says he was told to present a man with two sorities as a condition to fulfill his bail. He adds that it was Malamin Jane that bailed him from the police for $4 million he earned. He now tells the commission what happened when he appeared at Algali Commission. Now at the commission, the conclusion of the commission was that my tax liability is $1.5 million. I was in the commission, I was in the commission, and I was in the commission, and I was I had already paid tax for the period. I was in the commission. And by the analysis made by Panelka Foster, uh, it was found that my tax was overpaid $50,000. Yet the, the commission came to the conclusion that I owe $1.5 plus million. Lambay further notes that Alanyi Marik Tambidu bailed him out with property deeds. He recalls that he later challenged the tax liability but was asked to first pay half of what he was charged for but says he refused. In 1996, he took the matter to Supreme Court that the charge against him contravened the law and was irrelevant but it was struck out by the military decree. He instead received another heavy loss in return. So by writ of fairer fascist, dated 9 January 1996, the Inspector General of Police was commanded to seize and sell that of my goods and chattels found anywhere within the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court and caused to be levied the sum of $1,562,696.28 brutus and also interest and cost of execution which sum was by order of the Commission at George on 12 December 1995 to be paid by me. Mr. Mbai, still reluctant to go by the Supreme Court order, filed an appeal at the Gambia Court of Appeal but received a dead trade this time around. Then there followed threats to my life of being found six feet deep in the ground. The threat, the threat was first announced on Radio Gambia. The chairman has said all those advocating human rights, especially those who have just been sacked out of the government, they have to keep their mouths shut or they'll find themselves six feet deep. According to him, he did not further pursue the court because he wanted to continue living. Loyambai says in January 1996, Yanko Basongo, the interior minister, then officer commanding Combo Division, led a team of police officers to his residence at Fajara to serve him an eviction letter on orders of Justice Al Ghali. He says among the things confiscated 
wa his house, car and furniture. For iAfrica TV, Omar Ahmad Duture reporting. The TRC resumes its public hearing on Monday with the former Justice Minister of the AFPRC, of course, of Fafa Mbai, and we will bring you more details of his testimony in our subsequent news editions. Now, the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has on Monday called for leaders in Asia to blow the efforts towards finding a peaceful solution uh, to the urgent crisis in Myanmar, sparked by the military coup in February. Uh, speaking during a Security Council meeting on cooperation between the UN and regional and sub-regional organization, he highlighted the relationship with the Association of Southeast Asia uh, Nations, underlined the bloc's important role in democracy, in diplomacy, conflict and prevention, and peace building. Fatma de Kansim again in this report. Antony Guterres, Secretary General, United Nations, said the role of today's Asians is more crucial than ever as the region faces an urgent crisis in Myanmar. He said he has repeatedly called on the international community to work collectively through bilateral channels to help bring an end to the violence and repression by the military. Today, ASEAN's role is more crucial than ever as the region faces an urgent crisis in Myanmar. I've repeatedly called on the international community to work collectively and through bilateral channels to help bring an end to the violence and the repression by the military. United Nations cooperation with ASEAN in this regard is vital. The situation requires a robust international response grounded on a unified regional effort. I urge regional actors to leverage their influence to prevent further deterioration and ultimately find a peaceful way out of this catastrophe. Addressing the council, the former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said both the United Nations and its regional partners now have a flattened window to cooperate through strong action to halt the ongoing atrocities in Myanmar and prevent a further escalation of violence. The former Secretary General of the United Nations condemned the brutal use of lethal force against civilians. I condemn. All right, um, we apologize for that and um, we'll uh, bring you that report in our later uh, bulletins. Now, um, to Kenya next, where a newly initiated gov uh, geothermal uh, project meant to boost Kenya's energy sector is also providing opportunity for Kenyans to venture in other resourceful activities to enhance their incomes. Uh, different agricultural and aquatic projects is already benefiting from the Chinese built energy project. Now, authorities say the project will provide several development activities for the citizenry. Here's more details of that in this report. The main objective of the geothermal project is energy production. But according to experts from Kenya's geothermal development company, Kenyans are bound to benefit much more from what is happening here at the Meningai Caldera. A caldera is the depression left behind after a volcano erupts and collapses. Inside this one, five 130 foot tall, 2,000 horsepower Chinese built rigs give us an up close look at Kenya's energy future. Even though they are silent for now, theirs is a success story. Over 50 wells they drilled have been found viable. Hundreds of megawatts of power can be pumped out from below the earth crust. But steam from these wells can be of much more use than just power generation. Meet Esther Njuguna, a geothermal energy director. All right, of course, we uh, also have to apologize for that, but um, you know, we'll bring you all of those uh, stories in our uh, subsequent news edition, like I said. But of course, for more details on this and other stories, as always, you can uh, look on our website on africa.tv. But for now, though, many thanks for the uh, privilege of your company. And bye for now.